प्रथम जोशी प्रथम जोशी कैन आई हियर योर वॉइस सो वन ओके आई नीड टू नो वाई द साउंड कमिंग सो लो लेट मी सी माई स्पीकर नो डिस्पाइट हाई आई थिंक आई थिंक योर माइक्रोफोन इज वेरी लो I need to know what was the page that I was on last. So slide number twenty-two. Twenty-two. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So I hope you all are preparing for your exams, and there is going to be a proctored exams, which means I think each of us faculty members, staff members, will be given twenty twenty boys to monitor. and you will mandatorily be using your computer it may be a laptop it may be a desktop but definitely not mobile phones and that camera and that laptop or desktop will need to have a camera so the camera and you'll have to keep it on it is similar to the anglo eastern online examinations they also require you to keep the camera on because your entire examination process is recorded it's not necessary that uh, they have to continuously look at the screen but any time they want to verify they will play the recording on a fast forward so the time limit is reduced and they will keep observing your movements where your eyes are going what you are doing whether you have used any unfair means so it is not a wise thing to do to try and use any unfair means you are the loser so try to be a little honest and we are going to be given authority for cancelling the paper if we feel that there is some uh, unfair means being used you will continue to do the exam you will do it till the end but there will be a remark from the monitor or from the proctor is a new word that i've learnt from the proctor who will specifically state why he has cancelled your paper so be a little careful try to be as authentic as possible and you can be assured nobody will fail unless he gives a blank paper so the correction level will also be given some consideration the point is you need to know your subject well and that is one of the key reasons why most of the boys are not able to do well in your professional examinations your interviews and things like that so you must know your subject very well if you know your if you know your subject you will be very confident in your interviews this without fail so i would suggest you do a little in depth study and one of the key ways to do well is to attempt all the previous question papers as many as you can as many as you can and sometimes the most basic questions are asked which most of the candidates ignore they think this is too easy so let it be and sure enough they make a mistake to so be very sure about what you are studying and make sure you attempt all the previous examination papers so that will be the catch and i don't have too many of them i have already sent a few i think and i have tried to make some questions of my own and i have sent those also to you so do look up those questions try to find answers and if you are unable to find the answers do not hesitate to ask but do not keep it un unknown to you in other words do not be ignorant where questions are asked and you will be i was pretty surprised while i was taking practical questions of the 2017 nt batch and it was quite disappointing very honestly i will tell you the viva who say that i had with them i had asked them exactly what was taught in class and they still seemed ignorant this is the thing that is very very unusual what has been taught to you you are still ignorant on the information that has been imparted to you that is the most 
painful part for the teacher. It either means you have not understood and not bothered to get it clarified, or you have not paid attention when the subject matter was given to you. Now, I have a question for you. I have asked the other section, and I am going to put it to you also. It's an interesting question. It's about ships and, uh, and what we are doing about performance of the engine. So I will tell you a few things before I ask you the question. See, when the ship is running at full RPM, 100% RPM, 100% okay, designated maximum RPM, it does not mean the engine is performing at 100% of its power. It may be performing at 90% of its power, but the ship and propeller RPM is at 100%. All right. Likewise, the engine might be performing at 100% of its power, but the propeller RPM is not getting to 100% of its designated RPM. It is not always that the engine power and the propeller be always matched for a particular power so much RPM. This doesn't happen. One of the reasons is hull fouling. Initially, it might happen that they are matching. After some time, they are not matching. You see, engine is developing 100% power, but the propeller is not coming up to the requisite RPM. The propeller may be damaged, the hull may be fouled, or there may be an extraordinary current, or the ship may be loaded in a way where the trim is not correct. So all these parameters come into being. So it is not, so it is not always possible that when you have 100% power, that you will get 100% RPM of the ship. And then again, the reverse is true. You may be using getting it developing 85 to 90% of the power, but you're getting full RPM. That is also possible. And that can happen if there is a current with you, if the ship is on ballast, if the ship has just been dry docked and the hull is very clean. So all these conditions which help the ship to flow and you don't need so much of power by the engine to develop that requisite RPM. Okay. Now, once you understand this relationship between engine power and engine and ship's propeller RPM and ship speed, I have a question for you. You see, when you're taking indicator cards, and that is our present subject matter, when you're taking indicator cards, there are a lot of parameters that you need to take down. All right. Once you take down these parameters, then only your power calculation has some validity because you need to identify the reasons for why the diagrams are not coming to the perfection. These diagrams have to be checked with the diagrams that were taken during sea trials. Sea trials is the time when the ship was new and the first time the ship has come out to sea. So that time they try the engines inside out. And during those times, they take indicator cards. And those cards and those parameters which are obtained during sea trials are the benchmark for the ship to try and follow during its entire route. I think I asked you a question before. Does a 20-year-old can, or rather not does, can a 20-year-old ship perform as good as when it was new? And some of the boys said, no, sir, it is an old ship and it cannot perform. I would suggest you refrain from saying, putting up such an answer to any examiner or any interviewer who asks you. Though practically it is reasonably true that an engine cannot perform the same after 20 years, 20 years as it could when it was new. But theoretically, it is possible. It is possible that a 20-year-old ship can perform as good as new if the components within the engine are as good as new. In other words, the tolerances, the clearances, if they are in the required levels as it was when it was new, the engine should perform. Whether it is fuel injector, whether it is fuel pump, whether it is piston ring, whether it is bearings, whether it is crankshaft alignment, 
whether it is unit alignment. If these are kept to what it was when the ship was new, the engine must perform as good as new. So if at all you're asked a question in the interviews, can a 20-year-old ship perform? You must say, yes, sir, it can perform, provided the ship, the engines are maintained in a condition which was as which is as good as what it was when it was new. So that way you can perform. Now the my question to you is when taking indicator cards, you need to ask the bridge, what is the draft of the ship? What is the draft of the ship? That means what is the level to which the ship is in the water? The forward draft, aft draft, and sometimes the mid ship draft. Now, when the ship is stopped, you have a certain draft. When the ship that when that same ship is moving at a reasonably good speed, it has a different draft. Okay. Why is that? And how much is that? How much will there be a change in the draft when the same ship is moving? So that is the question I put to you. When a ship is in steady water, it has a certain draft, forward, aft, midship, whatever it is. And when it is moving, it has a different draft altogether. How, why, and what? All three questions come into being. How does it have a different draft? Why does it have that different draft and what is the new draft of the ship in relation to the original draft. Okay, now you will have to find out the answers to that question while we start our uh, PowerPoint program. Now we have 53 cadets, uh, students inside and the total number should be 38 plus 38, 76 and 278. So this figure here should be 78. Here's one more, Karthik Keshri, Let Kamar, Let Kamar. So now we have 54. Uh, this is the list of boys I have. So one, how do I calculate, how do I, the number is, yeah, some numbers are given. You must give your numbers. Rajneesh Kumar Singh has not given his number. So it's very difficult to take the road. This, taking the number has become a mandatory issue. So you make sure. Yeah, you I have given my number, sir. Rajesh, but your number is not sure it seems. Anyway, Rajesh Kumar Singh 8144. That's why it's not visible on your screen. Oh, your now name is. You have a very long name. <laughs> okay, yes, never mind. Okay, okay, no problem. I think everybody's num name is there. I will take it at the end of the class. Now we are under pressure to monitor uh, the attendance, and when I ask the class in charge, they give me two, three, four absentees. And yet there are 15 to 16 absentees. I am not here to, you know, penalize you for attendance. Whether you attend the class or you don't attend the class, it is your responsibility. It is not my responsibility because my responsibility is try to give you the best information possible, the best substance where material is concerned towards the subject. And it is for you to absorb. You, uh, if you are not interested, if you are not keen on learning, you will not learn, no matter how much I try. It's the thing that they say, you can bring the water to the horse, or you can take the horse to the water. But you can't make him drink. If he doesn't want to drink, you can't make him drink. So that is why you. it is up to you. And I am not going to be so nitpicking where attendance is concerned. You attend the class, fine. But the problem is, we are under pressure to continuously monitor what is the attendance. I can only give the figure that I see. Right now, there is 52. So 52 from 78 is a big big deficit. So how do I fill up that deficit? But I am, you know, I try to make it as in interesting as possible for you. I know you are under a lot of pressure because your exam is starting from 23rd. But you have to attend these classes. Because after this class, this class is not going to be repeated. At the most, you can see the re-recording. And during class, whatever questions are being asked, pay attention to those class questions also. Because a lot of boys don't want to ask questions. They don't want to put themselves up on the screen. But they want to know the answers. So, okay, you get the answers for some of the more 
interested boys who will ask questions no matter how uh, silly the question is you ask that will not be the problem at all so anyway let us proceed and we have already given enough time turn on the caption turn presenting i think everything is there uh, you are presenting and i turn record okay so let's go on to our powerpoint page 22 page 22 Yes, here we are. So I was explaining about the planimeter. This planimeter, okay, first let's have the diagram. You see, I was explaining the planimeter where the chief engineer has custody of this particular instrument. And it's much like your much like your indicator card instrument. It is kept in a box which is more like a jewelry box. And this instrument is a quite a delicate instrument it has to be maintained carefully what it consists of is actually an anchor anchor is something to lock itself in position where it will not shift that is the idea of an anchor here that is why i put anchor in inverted commas it is a cylindrical block cylindrical metal block must be steel only it is painted of course with a special paint the, all these instruments, they have a special coating or a pin. So this cylindrical block at the bottom has a pin. And the pin is embedded into the drawing board on which the entire readings are measured. The drawing board is about the size, uh, is about half the size of the normal drawing board you have in your college. So it is a similar wooden drawing board, but it is half the size of what you see in the college and it is kept also with the chief engineer so this anchor is fitted in place at one corner imagine this white sheet being the drawing board all right and this has been fitted on the left hand has left hand side top corner and it is embedded into the drawing board the pin goes in so that it will not shift and on this anchor you have an arm this arm at the end has a elbow this elbow allows a rounded pin to be fitted inside the hole of a box the digital display box or digital numeric display box this box is a mechanical part it's total those come om prakash pandey what is the time Time is okay. Nine forty-five. This is all. I am not going to allow any more. Otherwise, it becomes a disturbance. So some fellows have given their attendance and vanished. So I would like to know who are these vanished cases. Anyway, let us proceed. There comes another fellow. Who is this? So, Parthiv Abhijit. All late comers. Okay, no more. I am not allowing any more. I keep trying to be considerate towards you, fellows. But the boys tend to stretch and overstretch the privilege that I'm allowing them. Okay, no more we are going to allow. So this anchor has an arm. This arm at the end has a elbow, bent elbow, which fits into a hole of the digital numeral display box. This digital display numeral box is actually a counter reading. This counter reading is similar to what you see inside a car or on your motorcycle where the R, number of kilometers is shown inside the car or the motorcycle. Okay, now each of these digits will move if the preceding digit moves 10 times. So you have the units, you have the tens, you have the hundreds, you have the thousands. Those are the digits which will give the area of this diagram. So this digital box has got two wheels two wheels one is in this axis what you can see in dotted line and the other one is in the horizontal axis what you can see in the dotted line and these wheels are ultimately attached to a set of gear wheels it's a very simple plastic gears those plastic gears ultimately operate these digits these digits are on separate wheels and on the rim of the wheels you have the figures marked out one two zero in other words, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 0. So moment it comes to 0, the next wheel will change over 1 unit. So from 9, it will go on to 10. 
and similarly for 100,000, etc. So this is how the digital box works. And on this digital box, you have another arm, which is a which is rigidly fixed to the digital box. And at the end of the arm, you have a magnifying glass. This magnifying glass is about three centimeters in diameter and three centimeters in height. Okay. And at the center of the magnifying glass, you have a cross mark that is called the bullseye sometimes. The bullseye, that means the central target. So this magnifying glass is used to calculate is used to go over the diagram. So before having the magnifying glass on the board, you can shift the magnifying glass and place the uh, power card. That means the power card has been placed on top of the pip on the top of the drawing board, and it is pinned. Pinned means those staple pins, pins or what do you call what pins they are called, the pins which you pin up against the drawing board. So once the paper or the card is pinned up in place, it will not shift. And on that power card diagram, you make a reference point at any point. At any point, you can make a reference point. Now here, the reference point has been made on the card, and the magnifying glass has been superimposed on that particular point. So that is called the starting point. And during that starting point, you need to take down the value of the digits in this display box so it might be a six or seven digits that are there and that has to be recorded on a piece of paper and then you start moving the magnifying glass uniformly at a certain speed and not too slowly reasonably good speed you have to move it and then go over the diagram with the cross point going over the particular diagram till you come back to the original point where you started from. And then again, you take the readings that are given in that digital box. So the initial reading from the second reading will give you directly the area of that card or that area in that enclosed diagram. So this area, once it is obtained, is a very relevant figure to give you or calculate the power of the engine. So be very, very sure and as accurate as possible because any deviation in the correctness of this area will give you an incorrect figure where the power of the engine is concerned. All right. So this entire assembly is called a planimeter. It is capable of swiveling at this point and this point together. It is something like your arm. You see, your elbow, your elbow can move in various directions but your shoulder is fixed all right so assume this as a shoulder and this as your upper arm and this as your forearm and the magnifying glass as the palm of your hand so you can understand and of course on a horizontal plane your whole arm or your hand can move in a circular direction vertical direction but the shoulder is fixed. So same, similar. So the shoulder is here, the forearm is here, this is the elbow, and this is the forearm, and this is the palm of the hand. So this is the kind of movement that is capable of the planimeter. I think now you will be able to better understand how it moves. So that was the idea to explain to you how a planimeter moves. Of course, it is moving on the surface of a drawing board. That is it. Okay. Okay, now calculation of the area, what is before? Oh, this we saw. Calculation of the area of the indicator diagram with the planimeter. So I have the steps placed over here. Position the magnifying glass on the card as shown in the diagram. Okay, mark a starting point on the expansion line to or on the compression line. It does not matter which line you're putting it. I, I expect you know which is the expansion line this is the expansion line and this is the compression line. So the compression takes forth from here and expansion takes from here and this is the exhaust line. Okay. Sorry. Position the magnifying glass on the card as shown. Mark a starting point on the expansion line to actually to exactly localize the start and stop position of the diagram. Circumscription. Circumscription means 
ho going over the lines with the magnifying glass that is the meaning of circumscription i have taken these points from the uh, internet so actually it is not my language it's not very clear also i will have to add, uh, change these words around here begin tracing from the starting point the starting point is the point which is the reference point and go over the diagram at even speed and not very slowly why is it not very slowly you see those wheels which are under the box they must rotate they must not slide on the drawing board if they slide then the readings are not correct they must rotate but sometimes if you move it very slowly the wheel will tend to slide and if it slides it is not rotating if it doesn't rotate it will not turn the gear if it doesn't turn the gear then the digits will not be in action so it should not be too slow and at the same time it has to be very correctly placed the magnifying glass has to be done very quick well actually one of the ways is to do it you make a trial effort before you go on the card in other words on a piece of paper you draw a rectangle a rectangle you draw 7 cm by 5 cm a perfect rectangle that is easy to draw and you draw that rectangle then from one corner you start with the magnifying glass and then you go over the four lines that are there and take the before and after readings on the digital display so you should get 3500 because 7 centimeters means 70 mm and 5 centimeters means 50 mm so 7 5 the 35 and 0 0 so 3500 mm should be the difference in the digital display box before and after a reading so that will indicate to you how accurate your movement is how accurate the working of that digital display is so before you draw the card make an attempt of doing that sort of a thing so it will give you a clear picture of how accurate your instrument is employ good illumination that means the light has to be good and you should be able to see properly use a good magnifying glass for accurate reading of the scale before circumscription that means before going over it see even 1 mm difference in the movement will result in a significant difference in the calculation of the power from that particular unit so it has to be a very precise process of measurement okay so the difference in readings is proportional to the area of the indicator diagram so you get the area of the diagram immediately there you are the calibration should be checked by measuring a known area example a precisely drawn rectangle that's what i told you just now so that calibration that means how good your instrument and how good your hands are in operating that instrument will be defined in a practice session with a rectangle and the magnifying glowing over it and you taking the readings okay this is the diagram that you are going with the help of that planimeter and the area inside is considered as a small a remember and the length of the diagram is measured by means of a scale a small wooden scale which is calibrated to coordinate with the spring that has been used in the instrument so the height is equal to a by l and the indicated power will be the average height or this is the height multiplied by the spring scale into the engine constant into revolutions the engine constant is actually the piston cross sectional area the large area that you have and the length of the stroke okay so simple understanding of how indicated power is calculated is the average height the height of this that is achieved by dividing the area by the length okay and then you multiply it by the spring constant or spring scale the spring scale will be given to you and then it has to be multiplied by the engine constant engine constant what are the constants one is the diameter of the piston and is the length of the stroke multiplied by the 
RPM or RPS revolutions per second. After all, work done per second will give you joules per second, and that will be equal to watts. And that watts in thousands and kilo thousands will become kilowatts or then megawatts. So this is the basic explanation to calculation of the power. After this, it is a matter of putting in numerical values into the system. Now here he has explained the system. Area of the diagram is equal to A that you have found by the planimeter. Okay. Length of the diagram is L. This is not one. This is L millimeters and uh, it is measured by the little scale that is given to you. That scale is of a certain proportion. It is not any ordinary centimeter millimeter scale. Though it looks like centimeter millimeter scale, and on the scale, if you see centimeters, it will be given as bar. One bar, two bar, three bar, or 10 bar, 20 bar, 30 bar, 40 bar, 50 bar, 60 bar. So each centimeter is about 10 bar. And the scale will be a little bigger than one centimeter. But each centimeter approximately will be equal to 10 bar. So when you put that scale directly onto that indicator diagram, you will get the immediate peak pressure, 90 bar or 120 bar, whatever. You can read off the height immediately. But a more, a more uh, uh, relevant figure would be to calculate the area and divide it by the area, divide by the height. That will be equal to mean indicated pressure, actually. So what you get mean indicated pressure is the spring constant coming into it. So length of the diagram is L, area of the diagram is A. Average mean indicated pressure is equal to A divided by L multiplied by K, where K is equal to the spring scale in bar per millimeter. That means every bar will have us at a certain millimeter. So that is called spring scale. So mean indicated pressure mip will be equal to a divided by l multiplied by k bar i think it's quite reasonably to understand now what is mip mean indicated pressure now that you have found the mean indicated pressure now work done in one cycle one cycle means one complete revolution here because it's a two-stroke engine is equal to mean indicated pressure multiplied by the area of the actual piston and the length of the stroke of the engine. That would be the work done in one cycle. One cycle means one stroke. Okay. So you have mean indicated pressure multiplied by area and multiplied by the length. To obtain the power of this unit, it is necessary to determine the rate at which the work is done. Okay. To obtain the power of this unit, it is necessary to determine the rate at which the power work is done. Now, indicated power of the unit is equal to IP, and that is mean indicated pressure, PM, multiplied by the area of the piston, multiplied by the length of the stroke, multiplied by the number of strokes per second, which is revolution per number of strokes per second. Okay. So that is uh, PMLAN is your is the new uh, yeah so unit of the final result the indicated power is given as pmln and that will be equal to area upon l into k bar <coughs> into length of this actually this should be small a small a and this should be small l into k into l into a M meter area meter squared and is one revolutions per second bar into whatever so ultimately you get watts hence multiply the result from the calculated indicator of our 10 to the power of hour 5 and the final unit will be in watts which can be converted into kilowatts so that is the process of calculating the power Next, what we have is, what is the data to be recorded when taking power and draw cards? When taking draw and power card, we do not take compression cards or light spring cards. 
that will be taken on a different occasion altogether. Okay. Now, because this purpose of taking draw cards and power cards is intended for two things. One is to calculate the power of the engine, that means the entire engine. What is the total power? Number two is to diagnose any fault that exists within the engine. And that is through the draw cards. Okay. So during this time, we, it takes about half an hour to 45 minutes. And during this time, we ensure that it is at calm sea, there is no rolling pitching, there is no change in the rudder position, and the weather is very good. All these conditions have to be there. And exactly at a certain point of time, let us say 11 o'clock in the morning, 11 o'clock, 11.00.00 hours, the counters are taken. And again, at the end of half an hour or 40 minutes or 45 minutes, when all the indicator cards are taken, again, we take the revolution counter of the main engine, say 11.40.00 hours. That means we calculate the number of revolutions taken in that period of 40 minutes to get the actual RPM. We do not read a dial gauge to see what RPM it is going and then record it. We record the exact RPM down to one decimal place, 106.70 RPM or two decimal places. So that is the important part when it comes to calculating the power. You must get the absolutely correct RPM, not reading the dial gauge. Somebody might read the dial gauge as 106, somebody might read it as 107, somebody might read it as 105. It depends on how you're looking at the dial gauge. If you can look at it head on, you might get the correct. And there again, there might be a slight error in the dial gauge. But when you take the counter readings, then the accuracy is much, much more. And because this RPM, which is taken from the revolution counter, will actually relate to the power calculation that you are making from the cards. So that RPM is taken from the revolution counter reading, which is given at the bottom here, revolution counter reading digits at starting and stopping. So whether it takes half an hour or whether it takes 45 minutes, you need to take those counter readings. Next is load indicator on the governor and fuel rack position. When we were doing the fuel pumps, you remember in the VIT, I do a diagram of a governor and the governor had one arm which was regulating a link, which was regulating a number of multiple links. So that arm of the governor has a calibration. This calibration is 0 to 10. That means almost 0 to 100 percent, sort of. Most of the time it is up to 70 or 80 percent maybe 90% also. But the possibility of going little beyond 10 is also there, but it is marked up till 10. So this load indicator position also has to be recorded. Apart from this, a lot of chief engineers, I also would do it to record the individual fuel pump rack positions. See, I one thing I missed out during drawing those Bosch pump fuel racks, was on the rack itself, you have a graduation much like what you see on the scale. It is from 0 to 90. So 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, up to 90. And within that, you have notches or markings. And these are against the pump casing. The pump casing does not move, only the rack moves. So on the casing, you have a pointer. This pointer points to the position of the rack. That is called the rack position. So that rack position also has to be recorded. And ideally, the rack position of all the units need to be more or less the same. Oh, there is a question here. Chadha has got a question. What is the reason for having different axis of wheels? So that is the reason why those digits are capable of movement. Otherwise, there was no other way. What is inside? is a set of cogs and wheels. And these wheels which are moving on the surface, I mean, I know you're talking about the planimeter. This planimeter underneath has got two axis wheels. So when it is moving in one axis, one wheel will be moving. 
when it is moving in a different axis the other wheel will be moving so at any movement one of the wheels will be moving if any one of the wheels is moving the cogs will be moving to provide for the digital units to be changing but raghav there is one point here if you move it over a line and move it back against that line the digital display will change will be zero because there is no area covered it is only covering one line and back again on that line in other words if you move that magnifying glass over one line and then you move it back on that line you will notice that there is no change in the digital differences it is the same why because no area has been covered it has covered only one line that is the reason where you will have two wheels so that it will it, actually you know you have to go into the theory of the structure and how it is made and theory of that but it is designed in a way where only the area will be measured and the movement through a straight line or a curved line and back again it will give zero reading in other words the difference between the initial reading and secondary reading will be zero if no area is covered this is intended to only calculate the area so that is why it is designed and made like that you can go into the theory of the construction of that planimeter and how it works if you want to it is available on the net i don't have it so okay and it is okay it is a good question in the sense you are interested that's nice i will appreciate that so the third thing that will be required apart from engine rpm load indicator and fuel rack position is the cylinder exhaust temperature you know one of the thumb rules is to find out whether all the uni units are evenly loaded is to check the exhaust gas temperature this is the thumb rule of expressing the load on the engine okay though it is not that one showing higher exhaust temperature is delivering little more power than the other one showing little less if one unit is showing 365 and the other one is showing 360 it does not necessarily mean the one with 365 is developing more power it may be same power or it may be one little uneven so it is not an absolute indication of power output from the cylinder unit but it is a guideline remember this the exhaust temperatures of individual units is a guideline to the power that it is developing it is not 100% confirmatory okay that 365 degree centigrade exhaust temperature means 600 kilowatts it is not that it the the relationship is not so linear that is what i'm telling you okay the cell but cylinder exhaust temperature is a very important parameter that needs to be logged down in fact when the engineers come and watch they want to check all the exhaust gas temperature and if they are saying all of them are more or less equal they are comfortable but if they see one is dropped that is something is wrong it is not developing the power it is guaranteed it is not developing the power if it has dropped significantly if we go into that later so next item that is of importance is the scavenge air temperatures because the scavenge air temperature means it is the density of the air that is indicated to you and thereby it is also indicating to you the mass of air that is going into the cylinder for the combustion combustion process if that air temperature is too high you will not get the requisite number amount of power because the quantity of air is determinant on the density or the mass of the air is determinant on the density and the density is dependent on the temperature so if the temperature is too high not enough mass if the temperature is too low then condensation will take place a lot and again your thermal efficiency will drop you need to keep it to the appropriate most appropriate temperatures these are called optimum temperatures and are intended or dedicated or you know uh, uh, recommended by the engine builders because they have gone through their processes 
and the ideal temperatures are made to enable the maximum efficiency from the engine. So the scavenger temperatures have to be up to a certain limit. Though on board the ship, we engineers make a little distinction sometimes with the scavenger temperatures. See, when the ship comes from a cold climate, everything is fine. That means when your ship is sailing in Mediterranean Sea or in North Atlantic, you will have a very good time. Your engines respond very well, no issues. Up to Mediterranean, when you come up to Swiss Canal, everything is fine. The moment to cross Swiss Canal and come into Red Sea, hell breaks loose in the engine room. Everything is so hot, you cannot cool it. You open more seawater, you start another blower, and still it is running hot. You have to reduce the fuel to the engine because the engine is running overheated. So that is why one of the key factors is the seawater temperature and ambient temperature, which determines the conditions inside the engine room. Nobody likes it when the ship is in tropics. That is the time when you cool that hot air, which is coming from the turbocharger, and the condensation, the amount of water that keeps coming out is like a tap. It's like a tap, continuous flow of water. So that water cannot be allowed into the engine. So we have to drain it out. So from your scavenge manifold or the scavenge air cooler, at the bottom, you have to ensure that the drain passage is always clear. No dirt or sludge will choke that. Otherwise, you'll be pumping a water into the engine. So the scavenge air temperature is a very, very important parameter when calculating the power of the engine. You must give it the optimum temperature. And in most engines, the optimum temperature is 40 degrees centigrade. Similarly, the lube oil temperature which is going to the engine is also 40 degrees centigrade. 40 is not cold. 40 is not cold. In fact, sometimes the weather temperature is 40. So it is quite warm. For an engine, it is cold. Give me a break moment. My throat is getting dried up. So the scavenger temperature should be 40 degrees centigrade. Next is air cooler inlet outlet temperature. This is what will indicate to you the efficiency of the air cooler. If the cooler, now the cooler has got four temperatures that you must read. One is the air inlet, which is at about 130 degrees centigrade from the turbocharger. And then what comes out should come out at 40 degrees centigrade. So from 130 to 40, the temperature must drop. Next is the seawater temperature, which is going in, and the seawater temperature, which is coming out. Now, if the seawater temperature is high, it is very difficult to get the air temperature down to 40 degrees centigrade. You need to open the seawater valve full and allow the maximum seawater to pass through that air cooler to get that 40 degrees centigrade. And even after opening the seawater valve full, if you don't get 40 degrees centigrade, you can do nothing about it. Can do nothing. But air coolers are designed to give you that temperature. And if you're not getting it, it means your air cooler is dirty and the heat exchange process is not being taking place. Differential, air cooler differential pressure. So the air pressure before the cooler is definitely much more than the air pressure after the cooler because the air has to pass through a narrow set of fins. And between these fins, if you have dirt accumulation, which is quite possible if your engine room air is dirty or your turbocharger filters are dirty and are not functional, then you have dust in the air which is taken in and it has to pass to the air cooler. And remember, engine room atmosphere is a little oily. You will notice this after every watch. When you go to your cabin, you take a piece of a white cloth and you wipe your face and you will see oily black. It will be oily and black because you can't see the oil, you cannot see the carbon. But there is oil and carbon in the atmosphere in the engine room. So when you take it, pull it, sometimes it will be a little yellowish. That yellowish means lubricating oil, vapor, not fuel oil vapor. 
so there is some amount of lube oil vapor in the engine room and if you the other parts of your body are covered with your boiler suit so they will not get the oil but your face and possibly your arms will be exposed to engine room air and that engine room air will have some amount of oily vapor so that oily vapor is also drawn in by the turbocharger and this goes into the air trunking and it goes through the air cooler so that air cooler the fins they get a coating of little bit of oil so the dust which might be there in the air gets stuck to that and that is what chokes the air cooler the dust and a fine layer of oil on the fins of the air cooler so this has to be washed with special detergent when the entire air cooler is removed but that is another part of the topic so air cooler differential pressure will indicate to you whether your air cooler is choked or it is in good condition okay next is turbocharger rpm and the temperatures see the exhaust gas temperature I, this is a question i put to you also you need to know the exhaust gas temperature from the individual unit may be 365 or 368 or maximum 370 okay the maximum from the unit each unit is giving 365 to 370 degree centigrade but at the turbocharger inlet you find the temperature 380 how does it happen question you can write it down on a piece of paper right now why is the temperature from individual units lower than the temperature of the exhaust gas before entry into the turbocharger okay if you know the answer you can type it down and let me know so i will it, it's like a feedback to me where you stand on the thermodynamics of exhaust gas turbocharging whether you've done your turbocharger uh, chapter satisfactorily or not okay and then is the flow fuel oil flow meter before and after readings you see the during this 40 minutes when you're taking the indicator cards you need to know the fuel consumption this fuel consumption can be taken very accurately if you take the flow meter readings before and after because some of the oil which is going to the engine not all of it is being consumed some of it flows back back into the buffer tank or that mixing tank so you need to take the reading of the flow meter which allows the oil to go to the engine and also the one that is coming out from the engine both of them now the fifth engineer has been designated to take the revolution counter at 11 o'clock 11 0 0 0 11 for 11 0 0 0 0 hour down to the second so he has to take the counter readings and fourth engineer will be taking the flow meter reading exactly at the same time okay so now this flow meter reading will have to be taken again at the end of the program of taking the indicator cards so you know exactly for this time period what has been the fuel consumption all right so then only you can calculate how many grams per brake horsepower per hour that is your specific fuel oil consumption figure so you need to have the time period for which the consumption is taking place and the quantity that has been consumed and then when you calculate the power you get the power you get the time and you get the quantity of fuel consumed so that will give you a specific fuel oil consumption figure okay next is exact time of starting and stopping the program that i told you 1100 Zero, 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 zero hours and again at 11 40 or 11 45 11 50 whenever you complete it whenever you complete the figure it may be 40 minutes it may be 42 minutes be 41 minutes whatever time but the figures have to be calculated based on that time period whether it is 41 42 45 minutes and next what you have is the fuel temperature and viscosity values these are not related to your calculation but it is related to whether your engine is being handled correctly or not the fuel temperature and viscosity they are also related at what temperature does it give what viscosity should be carried out from the chart and the chart is available with the chief engineer and the importance is in the viscosity not so much in the temperature 
the viscosity decides the quality of atomization and penetration of the fuel and thereby decides the condition or the efficiency of the combustion process okay next is what we have on the right side is cylinder hours these cylinder hours are intended to find out whether the engine is in relatively good condition or it is not in a very good condition cylinder running hours is an indirect indication of how much wear down has taken place in the cylinder liner all right so all the cylinders you will need to find out how many hours it has already been run since it has been installed so if you find one unit is giving less power you can identify the reason as being this cylinder liner is worn out to a large extent because it has done 36000 hours the other unit is doing very well because it has done only 2000 hours so it is an indication to whether the power output is justified or not so that is why we need to know the cylinder running hours Next is injector hours since last overhaul. You see, injectors, fuel injectors, they need to be regularly tested and serviced. In other words, they are taken out from the engine, they are pressure tested to see the quality of atomization penetration and also the pressure at which the injector is functioning. So these are done periodically. Whether they are working good or not good, they have to be done for every few thousand hours, something like 2,500 hours, you remove all the injectors, pressure test them. And sure enough, you may or may not find one or two injectors leaking, mild leakage. So you need to open them up, clean them up, put them back, again try it. And then you find it's still leaking, you need to change the injector nozzle and the needle valve. The moment you put a new one and you see it is working fine, you put it back in place. So when this has been done, has to be recorded. This will also be indicative of justifying whether the power output of that unit is satisfactory or not. So how well the injector is performing will decide on how long it has been in use, whether the needle valve and guide are worn out, whether the nozzle oil holes have become large. So these are just guidelines to justifying or proving why the power is what has been calculated next what we need is the ship speed these will be in knots and this will be available from the bridge we need to get up the bridge and ask him okay second mate tell me what was the speed of the ship from such and such time to such and such time he said okay i'll call you back so he goes and looks up his chart so the chart paper will indicate how, how much distance is covered from this point to this point. And that time period and distance is covered, he will tell you the ship speed in knots. The second factor is also required is the draft of the ship. You see, the draft of the ship when it is stopped is not the same as when it is moving. Whether there has been any ballasting, deballasting, fuel consumption or not, the ship when it is at stop has a certain uh, draft level. But when it is moving, it is different. Now I am putting the question to you, why is it so? Okay, find out the answer to this question. I think I should put it in one of my small questions. Small questions means part A, short questions. If I'm feeling tired, I've become too old. Okay, another 15 minutes and we'll call it off because we are more or less towards our end. Next is fuel consumption rate. That I told you, you will need to check the flow meter readings before and after reading and thereby calculate what is the fuel consumption rate. Specific fuel consumption. I'll put it in dots over here in brackets. SFC. Are you understanding anything or am I just talking to my laptop? Raghav, are you there? Yes, sir. Okay, that's nice. Otherwise, I'm not sure whether you're there or paying attention or not. I'm talking my head off. 
Okay, other than this is the cylinder con con oil consumption rate. Now you see the two stroke engine, the cylinder lubrication for the piston and the line arm is completely different from the crankcase lubrication. This I have already told you once before, but I want to implore more into you. Now, this cylinder lube oil consumption is a continuous consumption. That means the oil once consumed cannot be reused. Even if it is scraped into the under piston spaces and from the under piston spaces you have a drain for it to come into another tank. Oh, Kartavya Singh. Enthalpy before turbocharger is high as compared to each engine. That is why temperature before turbocharger is high. Enthalpy before turbocharger inlet is high as compared to each unit outlet. Why is it high? You have not answered the question. Kartavya Singh. And one more thing, Kartavya Singh, since you are in the picture right now, your email is bouncing back. Any uh, link I send, Kartavya Singh, Mrityunjay Das, Nikhil Kishore Singh has rectified his problem. And there is one Aruvashu, Aruvashu. And then there is some Kajare, Sahil Kajare. So four or five boys, the email is bouncing back. So Kartavya, I think you should check out your email, why the emails that I send are bouncing back. And your answer to that question, why the temperature before turbocharger is higher, has not been answered. But the concept is there. What you have got written there, the concept is there, but you have not answered the question. So an examiner will not give you any marks for this answer. The question is, why is the temperature of the exhaust gas before the turbocharger higher than the temperature at the outlet of the individual units. Okay, it's quite unusual that from the source it should be the highest, but at a fire end it is higher. How does it get heated up? Okay, enthalpy means quantity of heat involved or content of heat. Heat is a uh, energy. How much energy is there? You are telling me the energy is more. How is it more? That is the, my question. Why is the temperature higher? Okay, let's move on. So I was talking about the cylinder consumption rate. Cylinder oil, once consumed, cannot be reused for two-stroke engines, remember. So this cylinder oil consumption has to be recorded from a certain time. Suppose that fifth engineer, after recording the counter, he goes up to check the level of the cylinder oil tank. And he may be one minute later. So he will record the time as 11.01 minute and record the level of the cylinder oil tank. So when he records it next and he records it at 11.40, he will actually get it for 39 minutes. So that accuracy has to be maintained what has been consumed in 39 minutes and not 40 minutes like he was able to calculate for the fuel oil. So this will give a much more accurate reading on the cylinder oil consumption rate. The cylinder oil consumption rate used to be about, for a large engine, over 120 liters per day. 120 liters per day cylinder oil. If I'm not mistaken, or 90 liters per day. 90 to 110 liters per day. And Cylinder oil is a very expensive oil and uh, it is a different oil from the crankcase oil, completely different. So sometimes chief engineers are continuously told by the company why you are consuming so much of oil, why you are consuming so much of cylinder oil. But no chief engineer wants to take the chance of reducing the cylinder oil to the engine. He might have a complete failure of the engine. That is why. Next item we need to know is ambient engine room temperature. See, that ambient engine room temperature, there's this one thermometer which is located just outside the control room. And that thermometer will be read off every time to know what is the engine room temperature. Now, engine room temperature is not uniform everywhere. 
at the bottommost platform it is a little different from the upper platform and definitely it is different from the boiler platform boiler platform temperatures can be anything like 50 52 degrees centigrade even the hottest parts of our country during summer i don't think is 52 53 degrees centigrade but that boiler platform will be that much and you can't expect to be staying there all the time actually why is it so hot because that is the place passage where the exhaust gases rise and it passes through that exhaust gas boiler and goes up you are not firing the boiler you are not firing the boiler and uh, that is why that region does not have any blower if you have a blower then the thermal efficiency of your whole boiler is going to be reduced so it is intentionally kept hot to maximize the heat energy imparted to the water so that is the hottest part and sometimes unbearable but in winter that is the nicest part to be in if you are in europe most of the time you will find the crew member is there near the boiler is warm and in the engine room it can be also freezing cold if your engines are stopped and you are only trying to warm up the engine sometimes it's very difficult to warm up the engine because it is so cold so what you have to do is fire the boiler repeatedly generate steam and then heat up that water tank which is circulating through the generators and after circulating through the generators it is circulated through the main engine so there is main engine is being heated by the water which is circulated through the generator but the generators if they are not on enough load even there the water does not get heated up so we need to open some steam to heat up that water which is being circulated and that steam will have to be generated by the boiler okay and the last item that is of crucial importance is the sea water temperature this sea water temperature will ultimately be the reason for your comfort or discomfort in the engine room same for the comfort and discomfort of the engine if the sea water is 15 degree centigrade it is ideal condition that means you can control the temperature of the air cooler the lubricating oil the fresh water everything you can control very conveniently otherwise there are times when the sea water temperature is 31 32 degrees 32 degrees is very rare more highest sea water temperature we have come through is 31 degrees centigrade maybe red sea area will be 32 degrees but mostly 31 degrees is the highest sea water temperature we have en- i have encountered and once it is there then the maximum opening of the sea water to the cooler does not cool the air cooler enough it is like that sometimes if especially in old ships where the capacity of the cooler is just about enough or marginally more than what is required so that if it is slightly dirty the cooling efficiency drops okay any more questions you have you definitely put down and these indicator cards what we are talking about have to be taken in the following condition smooth sea calm weather no change in course oh it is supposed to be the time when you should be sitting on the deck comfortably on a easy chair with a sun umbrella possibly in your swimming costume on a something like a sea beach but you will be down in the engine room taking indicator cards this is the weather you should be on the deck you will find the deck officers having a good time where the engineers are in the engine room so that will be the life that you have chosen and you must have no regrets okay the fuel rack must not be disturbed must not disturb the fuel rack because it is at that particular load that you are taking all the cards the temperatures pressures related to the engine must be steady once it is running at a uniform rpm then the automatic valves don't need to work they come and stay stand steady at a certain point that means the rate of heating is equal to rate of cooling and the temperature is uniform so that is the idea when taking power cards and draw cards and last but not least no ballasting all deballasting is permitted same you cannot do any pumping of bilges during that time in fact we keep the deck officers also informed 
that we are going to take power cards and draw card to ensure that you tell us that weather will be calm there will be no changes in the fuel rack positions etc so these are the conditions next what we go through is fault indication in indicator cards okay now we are starting on this particular area and i have still not completed all the drawings there are some drawings which i have made but i have to still scan them and then put them on the uh, powerpoint so some drawings i have made recently yesterday i was making them i have not yet completed so possibly after the exams we will do a little bit of this and then the next subject we will be going to is sea trials sea trials of ship okay now here is the first one which i have shown here if there is early fuel injection now don't confuse vit here vit is a separate issue where we discuss vit we'll discuss vit right now we are not discussing vit if for a normal engine which has a fixed injection duration we have early injection early fuel injection that means the cam has shifted for some reason the fuel is being injected much earlier the spring force has been not satisfactory in the injector then at a lighter pressure only fuel will inject so then you will have a diagram something like this the power card will be showing up with a very high peak pressure and likewise the fuel injection will be starting much earlier than what is normal so in the process you will have a very high rate of rise in pressure and a very high peak pressure and that will amount to knocking of the diesel engine knocking i told you what is knocking about very high rate of rise in pressure and that is more or less like hitting the piston crown with a sledge hammer and that impact on top of the piston amount to actually hammering the bearings the crosshead bearing the bottom end bearing and ultimately the main bearing of the tank shaft so these bearings will get damaged not the piston will happen to the piston nothing will happen to the liner nothing will happen to the piston rod but the weakest point or the weakest elements in the line of action are the bearings and these bearings may crack may break so it is essential not to have knocking of the diesel engine by having correct fuel injection now if you have late fuel injection there will be no knocking definitely but there will be lot of loss in power and there will be a smoke discharge you see if you have the dotted line as the normal process where everything is normal here also the draw card is made in the dotted line as being normal the real lines will show with a reduced height in the power card and reduced work done in the area of that diagram so and again on the draw card you will see the fuel injection is taking starting at a very late stage therefore combustion also starts at a late stage by that time the piston will have traveled more than its normal position and before the pressure can reach this a peak temperature peak pressure the piston will be coming down and expansion will be taking place which means the peak will never be achieved and in this process you lose a lot of fuel you have a lot of smoke coming out and of course there will be a reduction in power so this are these are the effects of early fuel injection and late fuel injection all right as of now this is all next let us look at the next diagram hey just a minute what is this it may be due to increase in pressure at the inlet of turbocharger rahul kumar patel an applause for you that's right and that compression or compression is called adiabatic compression you might have studied in in your thermodynamics without any increase in heat energy but the rise in temperature is there because there is compression okay but rahul uh, uh, who was the in research in the limited rahul you are supposed to be paying attention to what i am saying you are thinking about my question 
think of it later. I hope you are paying attention to what I am saying. Otherwise, you are missing out. While you are thinking about why is the temperature before the turbocharger higher than the temperature at the exit of the individual units. Since there is a diffuser arrangement, so the pressure increases on the expense of velocity. So temperature increases. Yes, to some extent, the right. You can say there is adiabatic compression period. Adiabatic compression means without any heat input, you are having a rise in temperature. Okay, good thinking. I like that. At least everybody is making an attempt. There's another important question I would like to ask you. A turbocharger, okay, actually, we can't finish this. Your time is also coming to an end. So, in a turbocharger, if you see the exhaust gas pressure is, say, three bar. Once the exhaust valve is open, the pressure comes to the turbocharger, okay? That exhaust gas pressure is, let us say, three bar. Okay, so three bar exhaust gas pressure is entering the turbine. The blower, which is pumping air into the air cooler, before the pressure of the air cooler, you have a pressure of four bar. So how is it possible that a machine which is fed with a pressure of three bar is developing a pressure of four bar? That means a machine is more than 100% efficient. How do you explain that? Okay, so now pay attention to the next plate and think of this after the class. The next what we have is after burning. You see, just now we saw this question here, late fuel injection. This late fuel injection is also a result or is also comes out as a consequence where there is late or other after burning. If the fuel is injected late, the combustion will also be late and there will be after burning. So this is a diagram which is identical to late fuel injection, sorry, not this, which is identical to late fuel injection and is the same as after burning. Okay, see here injection has been late, so the fuel peak pressure does not develop. So it continues to burn later and the, there is a significant pressure drop in the peak pressure. So if we ask you, draw a diagram, or draw indicator diagrams to show after burning. So you draw this diagram. And then I tell you, draw a indicator diagram and draw card to show late fuel injection. Again, you can draw the same diagram because both the diagrams are identical. All right, and both have late injection and after burning with similar pressure drop in the peak pressure. And both are indicative of poor performance of the engine. Okay, now if you have a fuel injector which is leaking, then again, the pressure at which it is being atomized will not be there. So that will be indicated with a multiple step sort of a arrangement in the draw card. And there again, there will be a little drop in the power. A leaking injector does not necessarily mean there will be more fuel going in. I suppose there will be more fuel going in, but that fuel will not burn. So if it doesn't burn, then the power is not being developed there. And similarly, the peak pressure is not being reached. So there again, a leaking fuel injector will have a display which is like that which is a little bit of a zigzag towards this system. So these are the readings which can be made on the indicator card to diagnose a fault. You must be able to recognize these diagrams and be able to tell what the fault is. This is the fault of a leading, a leaking injector. Next, what we have is partly choked injector. This partly choked injector will have at the start also some amount of variation in the pressure and end of it also. In both cases, again, there will be loss in power and the peak pressure will not be reached. So this is a partly choked injector. 
in the case of poor compression within the cylinder the indicator card will be this format and the draw card will be in this format which is showing a difference in the pressure drop this could mean your piston rings are not sealing or your liner is worn out or your one of your mountings is leaking or your exhaust valve is leaking or your air inlet valve is also leaking so any leakage and where the integrity of your combustion chamber is lost will be indicated through low compression and this will be the indication now i could put a question to you draw a indicator card and draw card to show that your exhaust valve is leaking so this could be one of the reason why it is leaking with the fuel cut off remember this diagram has to be done with the fuel cut off show that the exhaust valve is leaking with the fuel cut off so you will draw immediately a diagram with the normal one in the dotted form and a full line with the actual form so this is with the fuel i should write over here low compression fuel cut off how do i put it i have to insert something insert okay insert text box okay yeah and make sure it is well understood yeah so now that makes sense this is with the fuel cut off i think it makes more sense now okay next what we have is i should have done for the other class next what we have is the light spring indicator diagram this light spring indicator diagram is intended to show you how well the engine is breathing whether the air coming into the engine is satisfactory whether it is coming late whether it is coming early whether the exhaust port is choked or whether the scavenge port is choked things like that so here we have a light spring diagram where the exhaust valve this dotted line is the normal diagram okay so this mid position between the three of them is the normal position at which the exhaust valve opens now this diagram i would like to go back to one diagram here yeah this one you see what happens over here at the lower region of the card is what is seen in the light spring diagram the light spring is such that the movement of the piston it reaches the end position because the spring is not a very hard spring it is a soft spring so when it comes down when the pressure is low then it records the real readings what is happening here so what is happening here is actually related to what you see over yeah no not here yeah so this is the real picture what is happening at the lower part so you see the dotted line comes up to almost the atmospheric line and if it is supercharged if it is a supercharged engine then it will be a little above the atmospheric line but if it is a normally aspirated engine then the dotted line should be right up to the dot up to the a point of uh, atmospheric line and then at this point the inlet port opens you see over here it is given exhaust port open inlet port open and bdc similarly here the exhaust valve or inlet exhaust port open at the top of point here any of the three and then this point as the pressure change takes place is the point at which the inlet port opens so the air comes in to the cylinder and there is a pressure rise and this rise in pressure continues till the point where the piston reaches the bdc once it reaches the bdc it is like a wall so the no more air can come in so because it suddenly stops the momentum of that air which also has some mass causes a slight drop in pressure and results in this loop what you see here this momentum of the air coming in sort of retracts and there's a slight drop in pressure which shows up in the form of a loop the loop is shown as a little more than what it should be it should be a very small one but to highlight the fact highlight the fact i made a very big loop it is a very small loop almost insignificant 
and then as the piston starts traveling towards the speedy c compression starts but no real compression starts because the air is open from the inlet port and then once the inlet port closes some amount of air escapes through the exhaust port and that is what provide for some amount of cooling it is the same situation as what you would see in the four stroke engine where both the valves are open that means air comes in from the inlet and goes out from the exhaust and it provides for cooling of the components the piston crown the exhaust valve part of the liner so these parts are marginally cooled during the process of having some extra air come out from the engine there is a loss of air but this loss of air has a benefit in the process of cooling the components so thereafter the compression starts and it reaches the normal line for beginning of compression now this is the a diagram which will show you if the point at which the exhaust valve is opening too early correct time or too late so we'll get a diagram here if it is got only exhaust ports then this there will be no variation here it will be a fixed position because you cannot change the position of the exhaust and inlet ports so when the piston opens the exhaust port the timing is fixed timing of opening the inlet port is also fixed so over here we have got the timing of the exhaust port opening and over here it is exhaust valve opening so there therefore you see a variation here whereas here the exhaust port opening is fixed and if there is a choke exhaust valve again why should of i should have written choke exhaust port i made a mistake yeah it should have been port yeah how do i delete this let's insert a port right on top of this see i also make lot of mistakes p o r t okay not exhaust valve it is port okay i just have overwritten it choked exhaust port so then what happens the exhaust is not able to discharge and by the time the piston comes to open the inlet port the exhaust gas has not gone out so that's why you have a pressure already inside the exhaust inside the cylinder and then the air pressure comes in along with the exhaust gas both start mixing and whatever can enter by the time the piston reaches its bdc and then starts compressing so now what is inside the cylinder is a mixture of exhaust gas as well as some amount of fresh air so then the compression starts and this is the compression line that starts it's a little marginally lower so what you see is that the line which is actually taking place does not reach the atmospheric line because the passage is choked all the exhaust gases cannot go out so the pressure does not drop to atmospheric pressure and by the time it reaches the inlet port the piston edge opens the inlet port the air starts coming in and the rise in pressure is immediately there and this rise in this curve should have been right from here and then from there to be a more accurate i think i'll have to improve this sketch this sketch is not satisfactory to my liking next what you have is incorrect fuel injection this is the same thing where you have timing is oh i should have removed this okay bad quality fuel these are the reasons that are given i don't think i should show you this plate it is the same thing as the first one where it says injection early or incorrect fuel injection timing is early see it is earlier than before so the peak pressure is very high and then again leaking exhaust valve leaking past its end oh, that's all i don't have any more plates to show you so we'll call it a day today and uh, your examination you be preparing for it to the best what you can and one of the guidelines i can tell you is go through the old questions and there are some cadets who are getting their doubts clarified through the whatsapp i appreciate that 
and I will try to help you out as much as I can with any questions that you have. And you can send it to me through WhatsApp and do the old questions as much as possible. Because I'm pretty sure this time IMU has not asked us to make fresh question papers. So they are more likely to have old 